Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, latest instalment of our Inspirability Talks. It's uh, yeah, it is actually a morning. I think most of them have been either the afternoon or evening. Um, looking out the window here, um, we could probably get some flying in today, but uh, as we can't, you know, it's probably uh, not a bad thing that we can save our pennies ready for Christmas, and perhaps also um, save our pennies to support airability, which is why we're here today. These Inspirability Talks are designed to. Um, get everybody connected in the virtual world as we can't see each other face to face, but to really underwrite the survival of uh, this wonderful charity. So if you're able, uh, you can see the um, the link on the bottom of the screen there to uh, to keep this uh, this organization alive. Um, and uh, we're doing that with these with these talks. And um, I'm delighted to say that uh, today we're going to be joined by a chap by the name of Al Sparks. Um, and uh, Al has got a, a really, really interesting career. He's another military aviator. And um, we met Al through uh, one of the aerobility um, uh, folks at Blackbush, Liz, uh, who used to fly with Al in the Royal Air Force. Um, so I'm expecting plenty of banter from you, Liz, today. Um, but a quick bio about Al uh, and, and, uh, and his career. So he's got 5,000 hours. Um, and has been 20 years uh, flying rotary wing uh, aircraft, um, but uh, didn't do that for his entire career. In fact, he joined um, the army uh, at Sandhurst at the Royal Military Academy in 1996, uh, and then joined the Royal Horse Artillery at Topcliffe uh, in Yorkshire, uh, and uh, had uh, an operation deployment into Bosnia, uh, and uh, was very much uh, you know, firmly on the ground until he transferred across to the uh, Army Air Corps, uh, where he had a very interesting and varied uh, number of tours on the Lynx helicopter. So the Battlefield helicopter that um, I think set a world speed record back in the 1980s, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure Al can tell us about that. Um, but uh, Al actually then crossed over to the dark side, to the Royal Air Force um, in 2007, and um, um, has flown the Chinook ever since. Uh, there's not anything he hasn't done know where he's been uh, that, uh, you know, will not uh, spike your interest and just keep you uh, fully engaged this morning. He's done an incredible uh, uh, number of uh, uh, operational tours, Op Herrick in Afghanistan, uh, Rumen in, in the Caribbean, uh, Newcomb in Mali, and then finally Op Shader back to Afghanistan. Um, he's a Chinook instructor pilot. And uh, in his own words, he says there's nowhere that he's not been, nothing he hasn't done and uh, he has done everything on the Green Squadron, which we'll learn about uh, as well today. Um, he's currently at Cromwell um, on a multi-engine crossover course. So he's uh, doing the ground school and also some of the conversion training to go fixed wing uh, and potentially look at flying the uh, A400M or the C-17 from, from next year. But in his spare time, um, Al, is uh, a very active member of the Historic Army Aircraft Flight at Middle Wallop. You'll have seen them at the air shows, I'm sure, uh, flying the uh, the Scout and the uh, and the Beaver and the Oster and uh, other other uh, rotary wing helicopters there. And but he's also um, an active pilot for Historic Helicopters and has just qualified on the Wessex. So for all you rotor heads out there, this is going to be uh, a, a, a talk not to miss. So somewhere in the background should be Al. Are you there, Al? Uh, morning, John. How are you? Good morning. Yeah, I'm really well, thanks. And and first things first, I should say that this morning we're all we're all uh, watching Al through our NVGs. Um, there's a there's a bit of a tech issue with Al's laptop, but uh, it probably just feels like you're uh, <laughs> you're back on ops. Uh, yeah, I've got to apologise for that. But anyone that knows me will know that uh, computers are not my best friend. And <laughs> having had it working last night perfectly, uh, opened it up this morning, and as you can see, the camera has gone tits. <laughs> so I, I apologise for that. As you know, I've just tried to use my daughter's computer and, and it was just beyond me. So uh, I apologise. There'll be lots of photos and video footage where my uh, face will be seen and a little bit clearer. But uh, uh, yeah, people will be laughing. The banter will be on its way shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> I can see the chat's lit up already. Well, look, we can hear you fine. That's the important thing. Uh, and as you say, there's lots of pictures to, um, I guess, to really... You know, put us in the cockpit, Al, and, and, and for us to really, uh, uh, you know, uh, understand where, where you've come from in your in your really fascinating career. So let's start at the beginning, shall we? Um, why the army? Uh, what was the what was the route into Sandhurst? Well, I've, I've got to take a step back before the army. Um, I was not your model student when I was at school. I found beer, women and, and rugby, not necessarily in that order. 
So I wasn't the most uh, productive when it came to getting my qualifications. Um, so um, I ended up joining the army um, straight in at the ground. I tried to go in at the air corps, but um, in night back in the nineties, the pilot course only had about two or three officers on each course. So my commissioning course, we had 100, 150 people on the course. If I remember rightly, I think 38 of us wanted to join the Air Corps. And in those days, you had to put four options down. So it'd be Air Corps number one, and then the next three uh, and more uh, likely uh, regiments. Um, so week eight, which is the first time we were allowed to talk to the, the regiments, that was then whittled down from 35 down to 12. And they only took the 12 guys that they'd sponsored to go to Sandhurst of which I wasn't one of them. So I had to put that flying on the back burner right away. Um, they then went and took four from those 12. And out of those four, uh, only two of them actually made it to the end of the course. One of them is still in the military. The other has left um, and is working for a defence uh, company, I believe. So very early on in my Sanders career, I realised I wasn't going to be flying straight away, but I kept that uh, in the back of my mind. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and every time I went to interviews, every time I had uh, reports, I'd say, yeah, but I'm going to go flying as soon as I can. So everyone knew that that was at the start of my, um, uh, that's what I would do at the start of my career. Um, Sanders itself then, um, very, very proud to have been educated there. Can't say I enjoyed it the whole time. It was exceedingly hard, uh, both mentally and physically. Um, but um, really proud. If I, if I actually remember the last day I was there, I remember standing out on the cricket pitch, looking back, going, really chuffed to say I was educated here, but so glad to see the back of it because <laughs> uh, they do make it hard. But but for uh, all the right reasons, you know, they are the product they're looking for. They're trying to train people to lead people to cross that hill to take that machine gun post. You know, it's uh, very exciting stuff, but very demanding. Um, but no, I was I was glad to see the back and, and move on after that. Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. And as you say, you know, the perfect grounding for what you were, uh, you know, to, to find later on in the career. So um, you joined the the Royal Horse Artillery. So what 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 what, what do they do? Because we're all rotor heads and and you know <laughs> uh, pilots. Um, well, it's changed considerably since I was there twenty five years ago. But um, when I was there, we had field artillery, which is a big gun. So you had the light gun. Uh, an AS-90. You then had um, MLRS, which was in those days, again, the grid square remover, if you remember from the first Gulf War. And and then you had air defence. So I think it was Rapier and HVM uh, where we used but They were missiles. So I was field artillery. So that was light gun and AS-90. Um, and we were based up in Topcliffe, up in North Yorkshire. And we'd go on exercises uh, for general gunnery up in Otterburn with a light gun. But the only place we could use the air not down in Salisbury Plain. So it took about a week to deploy the guns each time we wanted to go on exercise. Um, so you deploy the guns individually on low loaders. All the armoured vehicles for the rest of the troops would go down on, on a train. And if you're lucky enough to be stung as the junior subby, which I was, I then spent a week uh, Ralston camp, welcoming all the vehicles in, um, which was quite good fun in the, in the way because I had a bombardier, uh, a, a gunner, and a, uh, a lance corporal from the Remi, and a chef. And we lived in a, a 99, uh, sorry, 12 by 12 tent in the middle of Ralston camp. And each day, two or three armoured vehicles would pitch up, and we had to take them off the low loader and park them in their battery ranks. So in that week, I got to drive AS 90, Warrior. Uh, I think we had Charves in those days. So that was the recovery vehicle. Uh, it had a the chassis of a chieftain tank, but then all the uh, the cranes and the plough to, to help recover vehicles. Um, so that was interesting. Um, and um, also the, the Warrior was used in those days for um, the forward observers. I think they're called something else now, but in those days it was... All they, go, all they guided was they knew where the target was because they could see it and they knew where the gun battery was because they knew where the grid was. And they would then guide the ammunition and the rounds onto the um, onto the target. 
sat inside their warrior vehicle or sat outside on the uh, in the field under a cam net. Um, mm. So that was field artillery. That, that was good fun. So I went on exercises in Salisbury Plain. Uh, I say Otterburn. We went to America. My first exercise was in um, ah, what is it? Fort Lewis at the port. So just south of Seattle on the west coast of America. And as we landed, we were that the the training area is so big it has its own airfield. <laughs> so we landed there, and as we we're driving past. Uh, there was a load of Chinooks and uh, Kiowas there from the Hawaiian National Guard. Now, they had more than the Air Force has got itself. But the area was that big that you couldn't walk anywhere. So you had to use all the vehicles. So we would go, oh, even from the accommodation to the cookhouse would be a, a couple of miles. Uh, so you'd use the vehicles to get there. So um, we would have... Uh, the, the Land Rovers and Wimmicks to get the, uh, our light troops out. And then they would also tow the light gun. So I would be on AS-90 in England. I'd be on a light gun out in America. Um, and it was, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's, um, it's really interesting. I I, uh, I suppose most of us, when we hear uh, Royal Horse Artillery, think King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery in the Royal Tournament. Was there any ceremonial... Um, duties that you had, or did your regiment get involved? No. no, the King's Troop, if I remember rightly, are the senior battery of one RHA, um, and they are, as as you say, they're the ceremonial troops. Um, mm. Since I've left, I believe the Gunners have uh, done ceremonial duties in London, but that was uh, I was nothing to do with that. Right, um, I see. Mm. Yeah, you did mention the Royal Tournament. Uh, I do remember that as a child. Um, it was a great recruitment tool um, mm. and allowed you to actually climb over all the bits of kit that the military had in those days. Um, and I, I think, as we were discussing last night, I think it's something we are seriously missing uh, uh, for a recruitment side of the thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you know um, a return to some of these um, uh, outdoor events uh, soon, where that sort of uh, recruitment can continue. But um, but moving on to uh, that next step in your career, so you'd never let go of that of that desire to fly, and then uh, the Army Air Corps beckoned again. So tell us, tell us how you managed to, um, you know, uh, weed your way in. Um, well, I've had a PPL since '95, um, so I was keeping that ticking over in the background. And I say we have annual reports every year, uh, and each time. And this is before we could actually read our own reports because they used to be sort of, you were told roughly what was in it and then you never saw it. Whereas nowadays you get to see it. So every time I had one of those reports, I'd say, um, yeah, when's the soonest I can go flying? Uh, I need to go flying. That, that's what I'm going to go and do. Um, so my colonel at the time said, yep, yeah, fill your application in and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Um, there were two guys literally a year ahead of me uh, at each stage. And I went to them straight away. And the only bit of advice they said was, fill your application and triplicate because they'll lose it. They always do. <laughs> so I filled out my application, uh, got it signed off by uh, my battery commander and the commanding officer. And then I photocopied it three times, delivered the first set to the adjutant. Uh, and I was in, I think we just got to Germany at this point. Um, I heard nothing about it for, for months. Um, and I, I sort of went to the agent and said, um, have we uh, got any news back from my application yet? And he goes, oh, no, nothing yet. So I had friends that were on the course down at Middle Wallop anyway. So I asked them to ask around uh, where to where the best position, uh, best person to ask. And I got a name and I rang them and said, no, never heard of you. Said, okay, thank you very much. Um, so I went to the agent and said, Look, um, Middle Wallop haven't heard of me. So the application is obviously lost. Can you put that one in, please? Go, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So again, a couple of months later, still nothing here. Uh, and in the end, I went straight back and said, "Look, sir, um, I'm going to send this to Middle Wallop. I've got a third one. If you're happy for me to do that, I'll, it'll go straight down." And he looked at me and goes, "Yeah, yeah, we can do that." So that disappeared. And just before we went to Bosnia in '98, I think it was '98, '99. I can't remember. I think we went January '99. 
Um, I've got a note from, uh, I've got a, a, it was a letter because it's before the days of emails uh, from uh, the Army Air Corps saying, uh, we'd like to invite you down for pre-selection on these dates. Now I was in going to be in Bosnia in those at uh, that time. So I had to go to the battery commander and say, look, this is my application. It's finally come through. Can I get back for these three days of uh, selection? And they said, yeah, we can sort something out. So I did that. And then at the end of my tour, managed to get uh, onto the flying grading and pass that. I was then given a date for sort of six, eight months later, which was great. Yeah. Um, I remember my final interview uh, with third RHA uh, and the CO, who is now just retired from the army as a four star, I believe, um, sat there chatting away and everything was going very nicely. And I, I got up and said, thank you very much, sir. I'll see you in the future. Walked out and a new adjutant um, as I walked through his office and said, ah, oh, come here, look at this. He opened the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet. There at the bottom of the drawer were two of my applications and two of the two guys before me as well. And they'd never left his office. Oh, my so, goodness. Uh, yeah. So I'm, uh, I think it was in the times when, yeah, people were really reluctant to let people go and do other things because they, they invest so much money in you uh, mm. in each stage of training. They almost see it as a waste rather than a, I'm moving on somewhere else and I can promote your good regiment. They go, oh, mm. we, we, we want to keep. So, no, I think a little bit of out of the box thinking did me well uh, and the advice of the other two guys as well, which is good. So, advice, my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, you obviously, you know, set the right impression and uh, were able to progress beyond there. So, Tell us about the flying training and how did that start? And where, where, was that at Middle Wallop as well, or was that elsewhere? Um, it started off with a, like a week of uh, administration at Middle Wallop. Um, and then I was on course 35 at DHS, I think. So we started off at, at Cranwell and we did six months of like a, a month or six weeks of ground school, and then the rest of the four and a half, five months of flying training on the fire fly doing about 45, 50 hours on a, a fixed wing. Um, it was at this point that I realized I was never going to be a fast jet pilot because um, I really don't like ripping the wings off the airplane and uh, pulling the G. So we did the spinning, we did the loops, and I, I think I did them in half an hour rather than the hour because as soon as I could prove I could do it, I'd look at the instructor and say, should we go home now? And he goes, yeah, it'll yeah. be good. Um, so that, that was good fun, but it was... It's things I already knew because I had the PPL um, and they basically take you to that standard and then a little bit more. Um, so I really enjoyed flying the, the, the picture, but just not tearing the wings off it. Um, mm. We then went to um, Shawbury and it was in the days when it was 660 Squadron was the basic rotary single engine on the Squirrel and 705 would be the slightly more advanced stuff. So you Go to 660 squad and then learn this is how this is helicopter, this is how we fly it. They you do basic circuits, um, a little bit of upper air work. Um, and I think if I remember rightly, you started off doing a little bit of navigation. Once you got to the got the basics sorted out in the first three months, you'd then go to 705 squadron and you do the more advanced. So you do the instrument flying, uh, you do night flying, and you concentrate more on that. But again, it was um, quite generic and it was a way of um, getting used to uh, navigating and operating the aircraft um, uh, around the country, all, all on large scale maps um, and most of it at medium level. So that was six months of helicopter flying. We then went down to Middle Wallop and it they, they basically stripped you down from everything that you've just learned and rather than tell you well this is the way the army do it it's to, to achieve the same game the same aim but it's at a slightly different pace or you would use slightly different maps or whatever um so you're there thinking well i've just uh, everything i've just learned i need to dump and i now need to carry on with this whereas actually all they were doing they're just teaching you another way but it was all single pilot low level uh on a 50 thousand map and if you've mm. ever um, seen, you know, at 120 knots, you can cover a 50 thou map pretty quickly. Um, so the, the cockpit origami was most amusing. Um, 
and there are lots of people that have uh, uh, held maps up like this as they're trying to refold them uh, whilst they're also trying to fly at low level it's uh, uh, it was interesting times and to be honest mm -hmm. with you i think for the first five six years of my career the most capacity i had was when i was doing my final check because, as I say, you had to do everything yourself, the navigation, the radios, and the flying, and the operating of the aircraft. Mm. Whereas you then move on to your next operation, everything is dual pilot. Mm. Um, so when I got to dish with, the, the aircraft commanders, who were generally senior NTOs at the time, thought they were doing me a favour by saying, you just do sticks and poles, so you'll be all right, um, and we'll do the navigation, the radios. Uh, when I came to my first six-monthly check, I had no idea what radio frequency I had to talk on. Um, I had no idea what the procedures were because I'd just been following the instructions the aircraft commander had told me. Mm. Um, so I didn't do very well on my first check, but it was enough of a kick in the slats for me to realize, right, I need to work with this and, and change how I uh, think and operate regardless of what the other guys are saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very interesting grounding. and and. Um, you know, tell us about how you you then progressed onto the links, um, and you know what the role of that helicopter was in the army. Um, well, I I went from flying training to uh, Dishwood. It was nine army airport at the time, and we had well, there were there were three squadrons on paper, two of them actually operational at the time. There was six five six and six six four squadron. Well, and they had a flight of links and a flight of gazelles each. And then 672 was there on paper, ready in the wings for when the Apache came in. Um, and, and it, but it basically supported us in the ground role. So uh, I arrived at Dishford and straight onto the, the link flight of 656. And we still had the toe fitted. Uh, we generally didn't operate with a door gunner. So it was a, an up commander in the left hand side, and then it was the, the pilot on, on the right hand side. Um, so the aircraft commander would have above him, he would have the, the tow site, and then on his right hand side, if I remember it correctly, there was a, a, a joystick um, which did move it, it just acted on pressure. And then either side of the aircraft, you could have tow booms with up to four uh, missiles each. Um, so in the anti tank role, uh, you had these um, tube-launched, optically fire-guided, I think is what TOE stands for. So you'd have these four missiles on each side. The commander would get the target in the crosshairs, fire the, the weapon, and then the missile would shoot off the rail and trail a copper wire behind it. And as long as he kept the crosshairs on the target with, with his little immovable joystick, the the missile should home in onto the, the spot that he's looking at. Mm. It's all well and good in war because you then press a button, it chops a wire, and you can fly up to another battle position, do something else. But uh, when we were over, when we were training with these missiles, um, just like the soldiers have to pick up brass when they uh, um, uh, when they finish firing on the, with their small arms, we would then have to land on at the end of the day and roll in up to four and a half k's of copper wire. Yeah. <laughs> um, luckily, we only fired about one or two miss missiles each, but it was still a good uh, few hours of rolling that copper wire up just to keep the range yeah. warden happy. Yeah, yeah, um, interesting. But yeah. A, a question. Um, forgive me for my accuracy, but am I right in saying that, you know, in the Royal Air Force, you're a pilot, you operate um, in that environment, um, you know, in, in, in the air domain. If you're a pilot flying a... a uh, you know, a helicopter in the army. Uh, yes, when you're sat in the seat, you're a pilot, but your role is part of the infantry. Is that is that right? You know, you're you're actually part of your colleagues on the ground, as opposed to separated and being, you know, in the air. Um, I, I can see where you're going with this, and actually, it doesn't matter which service you're in. Your job is is a pilot pilot airframe, whether it be an Apache. Pilots, a Wildcat pilot, a Chinook pilot, you know, um, no, no, it doesn't matter. That That is your job. What you're recruited for and what you could possibly go on to do is certainly different. So remember, when I was at Sandhurst, we're all being trained.
to be that infantry soldier because you don't know if you're going to be uh, an Apache pilot yet. You might not get selected, you might get chopped. Um, so that grounding that Sandhurst gives you as a um, as a soldier first is is uh, paramount. Um, when you then become your army pilot and you are operating uh, your aircraft, again, yes, your primary role is to operate that aircraft, but you could be selected very quickly and early on in your career to go and operate in a brigade or divisional headquarters. And you then become the subject matter expert for the brigade staff on all things aviation. Um, re regardless of what type you come from, if they see you, you've got a set of wings on your chest, they'll go, right, you're a pilot, you know about flying. How do we, how do we involve aviation in our battle plan? Um, so there is a very close connection between the Army Air Corps pilot and the ground troops. One thing I was really, really impressed with when I came across from the Army to the Air Force, um, to a man, and I mean both the, the, the air crew and the ground crew, they knew that our job in the Chinook was to support the guy on the ground. And it didn't matter what they did, they knew that that was, that was why we were here, we're there to support that guy on the ground. So that there is a very strong connection between um, the air crew uh, and, and the operators and the guys on the ground. Um, mm. Going back to your question about uh, whether the air corps, are, uh, uh, air corps officers are infantry, it, they have, after Sandhurst, if they're waiting for a, um, a flying force, in my day, there, there wasn't much of a hold. So I think only one of my friends did a, an, um, an exchange with an infantry unit. Nowadays, I think it's become more common again. It used to be you had to do it. And they go off and do six months with the infantry or the cavalry or the gunners um, and learn about the trade on the ground so that when they are supporting them, they are better placed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now that interoperability piece, yeah, I suppose is uh, is is really critical. And um, and so your first opportunity to to really you know put all of that training in in into practice was was Optelic, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. Tell us tell us about that. Um, so Optelic, I was in six five six uh, no six six four at the time. So at Dishford, we had just. We had rearranged the regiment in preparation for when the Apache came in. So we'd made single types. So 656 became the Gazelle Squadron, 664 became the Link Squadron. And at Christmas 2002, we just expected to go on a bit of leave. And we were all called into the uh, the gym. And the CO and the adjutant stood up in front of us and said, right, um, in January, January the 2nd, some of you are off the war. <laughs> and this just blindsided most we had no idea what was going on um so there was about 30 or 40 of us uh where on january the 2nd were dispatched down to watersham to augment uh one of the regiments down there uh, um so i went down as a i was still a co-pilot at the time uh went down lived for about a uh well i think about four weeks uh january start of february training with the um uh, the regiment down at Watersham, uh, and I was attached to 662 Squadron. Um, and then in early February, we then deployed to Kuwait, um, uh, ready for Optelic. Um, we flew in a civilian airliner, landed at Kuwait City, sat there on the bus. All of our webbing and Bergens are all on the load into an ISO container in front of us. We sat on a rickety old jingly bus. And before we'd even started, the American military police came in, dragged our driver away and replaced him with uh, one of their own. Um, so I know I had no idea what happened to him, but it was quite a shock when we first got there. But things were about to get more interesting. Um, we then, just as we drove out of the airfield, it started to get dark. We drove for a couple of hours into the middle of the desert uh, and we stood there, gin clear night, beautiful big moon. and we arrived at this uh, tented camp in the middle of the desert and the guards were all in free Romeo at the time. So all their NBC kit, respirators on, um, and we're all going, 
what's going on? All our kits in the in the wagon ahead of us, we need to get our kit. And it turned out that it was just an exercise they were running. But uh, for my first 12 hours in theatre, um, yeah, I was, I was somewhat panicked, thinking, you know, what have I come to? Um, mm. So we spent, uh, oh, spent about four weeks uh, living around uh, Kuwait, around Ali Al Salam, um, preparing uh, to go to war, hoping that you know it'll all get brushed up and we'll we'll be home in in a month or two's time. Um, now, having flown for as long as I have now, I know the amount of training required, um, sort of environmental training before you go into a desert environment. Um, if I remember rightly, I had one hour um, doing some dust landings where we had to land crosswind to get any form of dust uh, into thing. Remember, I'm only a, like a 400 hour pilot at this time, um, mm. landing a skidded aircraft uh, in a dusty environment that gave me one hour before we then deployed. Um, I wasn't one of the first crews to go across, so I went across the, uh, the Iraqi border in the back of an eight ton truck sat on a deck chair, um, drove up about three or four miles, uh, sorry, three or four hours north of the border before we set up um, our camp again, literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, the aircraft were all dispersed. The flight truck, so the eight-ton truck that I'd been across the border in, uh, we, uh, we set it all up, put the cam nets up, and then dug our trenches, ready to sit there for however long it was needed. And about... Three days later, there was a big shout of stand to, stand to. So everyone jumped into their trenches, gets their weapons out, goes, oh, Christ, what's going on? As so we looked out beyond where the aircraft were, there was a, um, a section of troops patrolling across the open ground. Um, the guy that jumped into the trench next to me had been our driver, a young air trooper, and he was there with grenades ready to pull the pin, uh, so I had to calm him down and him to put his grenades away. In fact, I think we may have taken them off him and given them to someone else. But we're there trying to work out who these people are. And after about 30 minutes of them just patrolling back and forth, we sent out um, uh, a small wreckage just to find out who they were. And they were the MT section practicing dr uh, their drills. And again, <laughs> there was no communication. Nobody told them, yeah. to, told them to do it or told us what they were doing. So, yeah, the um, uh, it was a little bit exciting at times. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I feel nice and safe in my aircraft, but on the ground, I'm a bit of a wuss. Yeah, well, it's just very interesting, isn't it? You know, you're everyone's thrust into this alien environment. You know, li li little little to go on, and uh, no wonder everybody is is pent up. You know, it's um, I can only imagine uh, you know what those first few days and weeks were like. Al, um, tell us a bit about the operational flying in in, in Octelic. I mean, uh, you know, clearly this is where you cut your teeth. I mean, um, yeah. and what was what was the role of the links? I mean. You know, obviously in support of the ground troops, but how did that actually, you know, manifest itself? Um, well, I've already mentioned the uh, the tow missiles we had the, the um, uh, on the aircraft. So we're primary there as anti tank. So we'd operate as two links and a gazelle. And the gazelle would go ahead, spot any or look for any uh, tanks, and then report back to the the links, and the links would come in and engage them if required. Um, I it got to the point as as it got hotter and hotter, the aircraft became less and less uh, efficient and powerful. So we ended up having to take one side of the tow booms off. So we ended up with just four missiles. And then as it got hotter and hotter and hotter, we then went down to two missiles. And I think in the end we just had one missile. But the guys would uh, progress forward. We were operating around Basra at the time. This is before. Um, uh, the situation it is uh, was then, and it was um, the, the palace hadn't been taken, the airfield hadn't been taken, and the actual field, the the, the town itself or the city of Bazar itself was it, it, it was still fully populated and working like a day-to-day -day city. So we had to schnoogle up, and you've got nothing to hide behind in the desert. So you're flying as low as you can, you know, twenty or thirty feet. I've got no defensive aid suite like the uh, like the aircraft here. So we are literally using speed and aggression as our as our main defence. Um, uh, I think he was my flight commander. For some reason, shot out a um, shot out a water tank uh, rather than a main battle tank, 
and uh, OC18 now, he was on the other squadron uh, at the time, he was army as well, um, quickly had a t-shirt made up uh, saying, I think was he 663? Yeah, 663 squadron, main battle tank, not water tank. Um, <laughs> because they'd already engaged two or three uh, formations of T-55s and been very successful against them, whereas we haven't been that successful. Um, <laughs> So when there wasn't the, the threat of the, the armour to go against, uh, we were used mm -hmm. for recce, we were used for uh, moving uh, passengers uh, and sort of troops uh, around the battlefield. I remember mm -hmm. once we were at Shiver and one night we'd moved, taken the aircraft down to offer our services to, oh crikey, sorry. I'm about to fail again rapidly. I'm still here. That's all right. We're waiting. Liz will be laughing her tips off now with that one. Thank you. That's I'm, I'm back in the room. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we went to Shiva. We because we were um, remember I said that uh, soldiers will as uh, army air crew will give themselves to a brigade or a division to become the subject matter experts. We didn't have enough guys to farm people out. So I can't remember which brigade it was down at Shiva, but we sent two links down, one of which was myself. To go to, <laughs> cheers, Liz, um, <laughs> to go down to uh, Shiva to help them out to offer our services. Um, luckily, the chief of staff at the time had been a uh, a battery commander of mine, uh, a, a BCD um, out in Germany, and he. The first thing he said to us was, "I don't know how to use aviation, but if I give you a mission that uh, is just stupid and will get people killed to no effect, tell me." I will ask you to do some dangerous stuff, but that's what you're here for. Go, yeah, we're happy with that, sir. Um, so anyway, that, thought about that, and we stayed there for a few days. There was a, um, sort of sat in the shadows, there was a guy in American, uh, American fatigues, sort of uh, trousers, American desert boots, but he had a brown issue T-shirt, and he had issue uh, uh, British webbing, and an SA-80 rifle. And then he had his compass taped to the front of the uh, the, the, the stop. So uh, I kind of scratched my head. And he ended up being on my first task. And uh, sort of introduced us. I said, right, hi there, I'm Al. You know, we're, we're the link, so we're here to support you. Who are you? And he goes, I'm um, Task Force 19. Right, like, who are you? Task Force 19. Right, you're not going to tell me. What do you want? And he goes, we need to get up to Basra Airfield. Bill, I need to do a recce. And we go, Okay, any any reason for this? No, no, I can't tell you. Uh, okay. So thinking of, uh, and you know when you see someone, you go, oh, I know you, but I mm. just I couldn't put a face to. It. Anyway, stuck him in the back of the aircraft, uh, and we were going to um, do his task on the back of another task. So off we went, uh, and he's got his mate who's properly dressed, I'll say, um, in, uh, in in all British gear. A little bit bigger than most of us. He was in the back of the other cab. And off we went, took them up to Bowser Airfield. And, you know, oh, it must be a sneaky peek job, this, that, that. Anyway, he gets out, runs to the tower, runs up the air, the, the tower, or runs back down again, says, yeah, it's good to go. What, what have you done? Says, oh, mate, traffic. I've just come to make sure that, see how long it would take us to get the tower up running for the airfield. So he's a pretty a bit of a Walter Mitty that had dressed himself in, special fatigues that make him look special. So we <laughs> thought he was special, but no. And, and I, as soon as he said he was air traffic, I knew exactly who he was. He'd been at school a couple of years ahead of me. Um, <laughs> and it was, yeah, I know what you're doing. And the, the, his larger friend was brilliant. He goes, oh yeah, we're just TAC ATC. We just come to see how long it'll take us to get this up and running. Yeah. But on the way on the way back, we were retasked to go to the palace uh, and about 12 hours before, I'd seen the Royal Marines take the palace, so we knew it was pretty safe. Uh, so that, if I remember right, bottom southeastern corner of Bowser. Mm -hmm. So we had our three links sat, oh, just jumped over the, the hedges into the um, into the, the grounds of, of Bowser Palace. And the, the Royal Marines, typical Royal Marines, were naked swimming in the moat uh, and <laughs> in their thing. So we knew it was pretty safe. Um, and we were doing the anti-tank bit, just popping up above the um, the surrounding walls, having a look over, looking for the, the um, any tanks or armor. 
And that was the moment that it kind of justified to me being there because there we were in the grounds of this very, very luxurious palace with massive oak doors um, and window frames. Everything is gold. All the door handles are gold. The taps were gold, this and the other. And literally six feet on the other side of this wall was a shanty town. Mm. And it was the, the difference there. There was Saddam Hussein keeping all this money and wealth to himself, whereas rather than looking after his, his people. But within minutes of us getting there, we were then told, all right, you need to get to the university now. Don't worry. It's all clear. You can, you can get straight up to the top there. Uh, we need you to do a quick recce because I think it was the Black Watch are in there already and they might need some of your uh, assistance. We said, okay, yeah, no worries. I got the map out and there's a, what, basically a dual carriageway uh, that goes, almost cuts from the south, uh, southern part of Basra all the way up to the, almost to the canal, a uh, good couple of three miles. So this is 10 o'clock in the morning. We had three links doing 120 knots at about, um, light stanchion level um whipping straight up the the road and there's people on donkeys going to work and trucks and all the rest of it and we've been told yeah troops are all there everything's secure everything's safe got up to the university and i turned to my friend and said then have you seen any soldiers yet no i have not they must be well dug in well camouflaged and uh we thought right well we'll have a look couldn't make contact with the black watch couldn't see anything we saw a uh, a few military vehicles, but nothing we recognised. And then we put it out to the, the west, got over the canal to see all the challenges, all the warriors of the Ba'ath group about to go into Basra. Um, and we've just flown over as if we, uh, it was saying, again, with no defensive aid suite, uh, having been told by the intelligence, oh, yeah, it's all been taken, you're all clear, you're all safe, crack on. So it was uh, yeah. interesting times. Yeah, I, I can I can only imagine what went through your head, Al, and the discussion in the cockpit. And, um, you know, yeah, a, a really good example of um, miscommunication. And you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and you've just fallen through the cracks. Yeah, that's oh, uh, yeah. another kind of place to be. Um, <laughs> so um, you had enough of all of that drama and came back back to the UK and um, and you had a you had a brief stint in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, my father died. Uh, when I was very young, uh, but I remember so the only memories I've really got of him uh, when he was blind, and he had a, a general service medal from Northern Ireland, um, and I'd, uh, he's blown the, the Wessex out there in one of the first waves of Wessex from 72 squadron out in 69, I think it was, when they went out there. Um, so I'd always wanted to go out there, and to be honest, I'd always wanted to fly the, the, the Wessex. Unfortunately, it was... Um, Withdrawn, I think, 2002. So I missed 72 squadrons last Wessex out there. Um, but again, I'm still cat badge RHA at the moment, but working with um, the Air Corps. And a um, a request for somebody to go out on posting for two or three years at Northern Ireland came out. Uh, and I volunteered straight away. Um, the Air Corps were happy for me to go because um, they thought I was going back to the Gunners anyway. Um, but it took a while for the gunners to let me go because they were saying, oh, the Air Corps should, should support this um, rather than using, using one of you guys. But I, I fought for it and got out there and um, joined 655 uh, Scottish Horse Squadron. Um, and at the time, it was brilliant. We had, so this is 2003, so I've been only back in country three or four months. And we got out there, I think we had 19 links, 24 gazelles, and six Highlanders at the time for the regiment. Um, so it's by far the biggest regiment of, uh, of the Army Air Corps and the busiest. And it's where I wanted to go, where I wanted to do my flying, and that's basically where I learnt my trade. Um, I did my, uh, my theatre qualification, which is just getting used to flying around the area. So I flew uh, with a qualified helicopter instructor for a day and a night trip to, and he showed me all the bases, showed me all the procedures, getting in and out. I remember going into, uh, I'm sorry, this chap that was doing it, uh, Charles Chalice, that most Air Corps guys will know, an absolute legend of a chap, um, built like a man mountain um, with a fearsome uh, sort of reputation that goes with it. 
but in the cockpit, absolute legend. Um, I remember going into Enniskillen. I've been in once during the day, um, and then we were going in at night on goggles. So looking very similar to this at the moment. And halfway through, uh, so halfway down the the, the finals, uh, around the finals turn, he just starts laughing. And I go, "Is everything all right? What what's going on?" He says, "Oh yeah, I've never been in here this slow before." And I go, "Oh right, okay. I've got to remember, I, I've got four hundred hours. You've got four thousand hours. It's a subtle difference." But no, he, he was a really good man and, and taught me a lot that on that tour. Yeah, well, I'm I'm sure, and, and it's um, uh, you know, it's about the people, isn't it? Um, yeah. as, 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 as well as the job and um, I know I know that you're um, a very uh, well respected and popular chap Al there's, there's quite a few people that are coming out the woodwork here on the chat which well, <laughs> oh really oh, well, 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 and it's all good so so don't worry <laughs> oh, you're filtering there's, it well then I <laughs> there, there's no dirt yet but the, uh, oh, wait, the, come, morning, the morning is young um, so Okay, well, we, we talked about, um, you know, that, that transition that you made, Al, um, at, at the end of your, your time with the Army Air Corps. Tell us how that, you know, what was the reason for your move to the Royal Air Force? Well, as I said, right from day one, my, my father had been in the Air Force. Um, we, I was born here at Odium uh, 48 years ago-ish. I'm not doing math in public. Um, so I, I, I've always wanted to be um, an Air Force pilot. I must admit, at the time when I was younger, I didn't realise the Army had aircraft until I got to uh, to school. Um, again, going back to one of my first comments, um, I wasn't really your, um, your, your model student at school, so I didn't get the qualifications I required to join the Air Force straight away. But from day one, as soon as I got my wings, um, there was a, a girl ahead of me, uh, she was at my platoon in Santos, but about a year ahead of me in the flying training system. And because of foot and mouth, that had, she had a large hold um, where she, she wasn't training. And she, in that time, she transferred to the Air Force. So I knew it could be done. Mm. So I spoke to, uh, he was OC 60 Squadron at the time, and he happened to be going to be the next uh, posting officer. And I believe he's now an Air Vice Marshal. Well, I got on very well with him. And every three or four months whilst he was in post, I'd be saying, is there any chance I can transfer? Is there any chance? Because no, I can't do anything yet. I can't do anything yet. So when I finally got promoted and sent to staff college, which was a farce, um, they, um, I, I came back in uh, one bad November day uh, and I came home and my wife looked at me and said, oh, what's wrong? Said, oh, this staff college is just rubbish. They don't teach you anything but they just keep uh, pushing and pushing. I says, I'm not enjoying it. Um, and she goes, well, why, why don't you ring the Air Force up? Just see what see what can happen. Um, so on the Monday, I went back to work, rang the desk officer who had changed, and he was a friend from Ireland. They'd been mm -hmm. the 2IC at the time. And he goes, Al, I've just had authority today from the group captain to recruit people again. So get your last five OJRs. They're your annual reports. Write me a letter of why you want to do it and, and, a, and a bit of a CV, and we'll see what we can do. So that was in November 06, and April uh, 07, um, I was accepted. But I still had to go through um, OASC as if I was 18 off, uh, off the streets. Mm. And so that was done in January. And I, I'd driven up from uh, Shrivenham. I'm sat there in an interview. Um, and the group captain had almost given me the job anyway. But there were two squadron leaders in front of me. And they, they are interviewing me as if I'm an 18-year-old from school. Like, what clubs have you been in at school? <laughs> uh, I can't really remember. Oh, well, what positions of responsibility? Well, I've, I've led many on operations. Is that, is that good enough? <laughs> oh, 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 right, okay. Um, right. What, what has happened uh, in the last 12 months um, internationally? I said, oh, and can you narrow it down a bit? Because I've spoken about Iraq, I've spoken about Afghanistan, this, that, and the other. Can you narrow it down? Because, oh, okay. Um, what's happened nationally? I said, oh, there you go again. Um, can you narrow it down a little bit more? I've spoken about Northern Ireland, I've spoken about uh, this, that, and the other. And, and you can feel it, he's getting a bit uncomfortable now because they're not used to having questions asked of them. They're interviewing me. And he goes, uh, 
do you think we're going to have a plethora of uh, Army Air Corps officers that um, haven't done very well at, at um, uh, altitude and uh, have failed the interview? And I said, right, I'll stop you there. I'm currently at staff college. So I get up about half six. Uh, I do maybe an hour's work to recover from the night before. Have breakfast. You work then um, till about six, seven o'clock. You maybe get an hour for fizz, uh, half an hour for a meal. If I'm lucky I get to read the obituaries in the Telegraph. I don't have time to look into current affairs. But if I'm at home, uh, sort of back at the regiment, and somebody comes and says, Al, oh, what about this? And I don't know. I says, I'll get back to you, and within half an hour, I'll have an answer. So to be honest, to answer your question, no, I don't. And that 45 minute interview lasted about 20 minutes um, uh, because they had nothing else to ask me. Um, I'd like to say the system has changed, but a friend of mine went through it and he's a lot bigger and more imposing than me three weeks later and almost had the interviewer in tears. Um, and it took about six months before they actually changed the system. And now mm. I gather the transfer system is a lot easier. Um, mm. But no, once I'd passed the interview and they said, right, uh, I rang the desk officer up as soon as they give me the job. And I said, I'm in, you know, what, what's next? Because I still have yeah. three months of staff college to do. He mm. goes, uh, um, Al, what, what aircraft do you want? I said, the Chinook. Uh, without, without pausing for a breath, uh, it's what I wanted to fly. Um, and yeah, the, the rest, they say, is history. <laughs> Yeah, well, what a story, and and you know, probably one of those trailblazers there that, that did indeed change the process. And I know it's just a, um, you know, a very uh, common thing nowadays for people to swap between between the services. Um, so so tell us about the Chinook then. I mean, I know this is um, an aircraft that's very close to your heart. Um, yeah, the, this is where I've got most of my experience. So the last well, since two thousand seventeen, flying the Chinook, um, along with the Apache. Um, on operations where we have found ourselves in the uh, recent years. Uh, those two aircraft, about the only ones that do what they say on the tin, um, they're absolutely fantastic and very, very versatile. Um, so out in Herrick, so in Afghanistan, we would be the, the workhorse of the battlefield. Um, there's not a lot we haven't lifted or moved uh, inside or outside. Um, the aircraft. Um, it's a brilliant bit of kit, um, and I've been told that the Chinook replacement is another Chinook. Um, it's operated by a crew of four, so you've got two pilots that can sit in either seat, and then two crewmen. Um, and it, it is a real four-man or four-person. Oh, sorry, it's a, a four-man job. Liz, you're going to ban me now. Um, they, the, the crewmen work exceedingly hard in the back of that aircraft. Even if it's uh, just moving, you know, a cabin full of post, a cabin full of post will take 20 minutes to load because um, there's a lot of post to go in there. Um, moving all the, um, sort of just organising all the troops in the back. When you stood it in a 45 degree heat in uh, Long John's and uh, Nomex flying gear, with a 22 kilo um, uh, body armor on. And if you're too tall, well, I'm sure Bish is there now, if you're too tall, you're having to bend down to, you're putting an excess strain on your neck and your back. Um, they they earn their thrust. Um, so, the, the, you know, they work very, very hard. And the aircraft, contrary to popular belief, can't be operated without them. There is a little hole at the front, which I used to say you used to get rid of crewmen because you could plug in a, a wing mirror so when they use it for civilian uh, use out in Canada and they do logging they do it without a crewman but yeah. we couldn't do our job without the, the guys down the back um, yeah. so yeah so I've, it, the operations evolved quite a lot over the uh, over the years that I was out there um, we did I think on my first tour towards the end we took out, uh, sort of, we retook uh, Musakala, I think it was, which is north of Bastion. And that operation, we had six UK Chinooks, six Dutch Chinooks, eight American Chinooks, um, and then interdispersed with Black Hawks for command and control, Apaches for 
uh, support and the Kiowas for Reki. So it was a big, big package. And we lifted from Kandahar. Um, the Dutch operate the very same as uh, we do. Um, we try and hide rather than expose ourselves too much to, uh, um, to the enemy. Um, and the Americans just like flying straight level at 500 feet as a big target because I think they're more afraid of losing people to impacting the ground rather than being shot there. Um, mm-hmm. But there were two things on this big operation that weren't briefed. What you do is a hold and then the refuel plant. So we worked out our fuel and we knew we could get from Kandahar to the drop zone, then back to Bastion for refuel with a lot of uh, it's sufficient fat in the in the system but the americans were doing a longer route so funny enough we got out to near the target we just descended from medium level to low level so we're now we've flown through the level of americans we're now at sort of 50 feet and the duck joined us the americans were still at three to five hundred feet and then they came over the radio hold and it's all oh, right We've got all, uh, we'd never come up with a plan to hold. So we ended up doing three big wagon wheels. And I said to my pilot, who's now over in Canada, I said, right, you follow him and I'll tell you where everyone else is and we'll keep situational awareness that way. But there it is. So you've got three big wagon wheels of Chinooks going in opposite direction in a bit of a desert. And then it was, right, launch again, go and drop your troops, but at the ultimate. So we dropped them off. So we've now had the Americans go a longer route than us and had a hold. So when we got back to Bastion, there were lots of uh, calls from American on fuel priority. So we and the Dutch went and sat on the runway and ended up, I think, bringing the, uh, bringing the engines back to re- preserve fuel, even though we were just on the other side of the airport. And the Americans came screaming in, uh, all low on fuel. To, and I think there was only about three refuel spots at the time. Um, so it was uh, having a very well-planned uh, mission almost went to a ball of chalk because of those two vital uh, uh, missing elements. But yeah. uh, contrary to say, the, the whole plan was published in the Daily Telegraph the night before, even the routes we took. So, uh, yeah, yeah. You, can't, you, you can't make that up. No, you can't. And, and that was your first tour in Afghanistan, or, or Eric, yeah. is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now, um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm finding this fascinating. Al, I, I, we could spend hours talking um, on your experiences. Um, it, it really is really insightful. One of the things that um, you know, I know the Chinook is is perfect for is support of special forces, just because of the variety of roles it can fulfil, what it can carry, how far it can go. Um, you, tell us what you can about some of those uh, operations you've been on. Um. Well, it doesn't matter who's in the back or who's you're supporting, uh, whether they're um, special forces or um, front, uh, normal soldiers. Um, the job's always the same. Uh, and we try and give our uh, the best service, regardless of who they are. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, before we do anything, there's a big planning process, even if it's just lift the troops from A to B. So we as a crew will get together with the uh, uh, the commanders of the troop. They will tell us what they want to achieve. And we will then tell them how we can help them achieve that mission. Uh, whether it be putting putting guys into uh, a grid at a certain time or resupplying them once we put them there. Or most importantly, being able to pick them up at the end of the op or if they need us. Uh, for casualty evacuation. Um, and, and I must admit, I am very, very surprised that we haven't had any comments so far about losing any generals um, <laughs> because uh, I, I'm very, very sure that it probably wasn't the air crew's fault because the, the Wildcat itself has got a fantastic um, moving map and avionics suite, but I'd be surprised on uh, who gave them the grid. But that's one thing I said right at the start. When, when we train the guys to land at a grid at a certain time, we are uh, we point out that if you land them on the wrong side of a river, only, you know, the, the grid could be out by 10 metres. But if you put an obstruction between you, uh, sorry, where the troops wanted to be and where you put them, 
then the whole you could uh, potentially screw up the operation. So we're very particular about the planning and the preparation and how we support the troops. Um, mm. uh, and as you say, we we do we move everything uh, pretty much. If it if it can't go in, it will go underneath up to uh, you know, the crewmen are going to kill me for this. Uh, well, I think nine and a half, ten tons we can do. But remembering that the more weight we take, the less fuel we can take, therefore the shorter distance we can take. So it's all a game of uh, making mm -hmm. sure that everything uh, fits together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and of course, I'm, I'm sure that uh, not least, have you done a lot of um, uh, flying in theatre, uh, but perhaps, you know, you know, some of that rewarding flying has been in support of humanitarian relief, uh, disaster relief. Um, tell us a bit about that and your experiences uh, with that kind of flying. Um, that was rewarding, but I, I think the most rewarding was the the MERT, the medical evacuate uh, emergency mm. response team, uh, yeah. and that grew out of a necessity for operating. Um, mm. We would have one air, one aircraft on. Uh, I think it was fifteen minutes notice to move during the day, thirty minutes at night. And uh, when uh, when we first started doing this, we were sleeping about a mile away from the aircraft, and we would still make those timings well, well within uh, the requirements. So with the MERT, we would have a, a normal crew of four. We would then have a medical team, and it would be a doctor, probably an anaesthetist or a, a specialist in pre-hospital care now, um, a an A and E nurse, and two paramedics. There you go. And we would take the operating theatre to the to the battlefield. Um, and it was one of those missions that just instilled great pride that you you would hear the uh, the telephone go, somebody would pick it up, by which time most people are out the door. The person who got the phone call would take down the details and then run drive as quickly as possible as you could to the aircraft, flash the aircraft up and then make our way as quickly as we could to pick the casual people up. Um, I, I take my hat off again to the crewmen in the back um, for the sights that they saw and had to deal with. The medics as well, it, it seems odd but that that was their job. It was the crewmen that would often help out the medics if, because very rarely was it just one person we brought back. It could be, uh, I've had a couple of cases where it's seven, um, and therefore you've got everyone in the back there helping out uh, with a casualty of some sort. Um, we would lift in any weather, day or night. Uh, there are, I think, two Air Force crosses, uh, no, three Air Force crosses, one on the Apache side, where we lifted in pretty much zero visibility dust um, to get the casualty. Um, there is a, a great combination of an Apache flying on its spur, um, leading a Chinook who had no first say. The Chinook is formating on the Apache to get to the casualty um, mm. in the middle of the night in in dusty environment that you just literally can't see, um, which was a fantastic operation. And it was there wasn't a single shout that went that the, the crew said, "No, I'm not going." We we go in pretty much anything to go and pick these guys up. That, that was the most rewarding. Um, back to your question then about the humanitarian uh, stuff. Yes, in all the places that we've been around the world, we've always said, oh, would it be nice to invade Hawaii or the Caribbean or somewhere like that? Why can't we have a war somewhere nice? Well, in 2017, I think it was, with the um, uh, uh, Hurricane Irma, I think it was, uh, which devastated the Caribbean. Um, I was on supposed to be on exercise on HMS Ocean in the Mediterranean, and we got turned round um, with, when we were inside of Greece to go back to Gibraltar to pick up supplies to go across um, the Atlantic to then provide these uh, humanitarian humanitarian aid to the the population of the Caribbean. Um, nothing really prepares yourself for what 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 we saw. Um, I can't remember the name of the, the island, but I flew past it when I was going. I had to pick some, drop somewhere off and pick up some supplies. Um, and it was about a 200 mile leg south 
just flying in a straight line, but we were close enough to the island. And when we looked out to the, the west, if you remember the pictures you used to see at school about, or we see about the Battle of the Somme with the trees that they've got no leaves on it, just splintered and just devastation. That's what this island looked like. There were mm. all the way up the side of the, the mountains was brown because there were no leaves on the trees. They'd all been blown away. There were pylons that had been ripped out of the ground and, and taken up the hill. There were boats that had been in the marina that were scattered all over the town. And then there was um, the houses. I don't think I saw a single house with its roof intact initially. Um, so there's absolute devastation. Um, when we got to Gibraltar, we had tons and tons of food and water and supplies, tentage and that to take over to, uh, um, to deliver. And I think 12 vehicles uh, that the government of Gibraltar had donated, uh, flatbed vehicles for uh, support. So our primary job was to lift the, the, uh, the supplies onto the, onto the mainland, onto the islands themselves, and then they'd get distributed from there. Um, <clears throat> the, that there was crime was rife. We landed at a place, um, Harker Hill, to drop off um, uh, a pallet of water for the local population. So there's no running water at the time when we got there. And as we, as we were living, there was a bloke coming up the hill with a machete, like so. Big. When we went back to drop off supplies, we were told, please don't land there. Can you land a mile away in a secure compound? Because this guy had come up, there was a ton of water. He just commandeered it. And then he you know, fought these other people off, wait for his mate to come and pick it up and clear it off. Um, so then the Navy started dropping sailors off with the supplies to distribute them evenly or to those that required it. And then we go and pick them up again. Um, but I'm going to get shot down in flames now because the answer to most questions is two Chinooks. But in this case, it wasn't. Um, if we had been doing the undersung loads to uh, some of these locations, we'd have caused even more devastation. So mm -hmm. we worked very, very well with the, the naval wildcats. Uh, we would take the, the big, you know, tons and tons of stuff and drop them. Then they would then get repalletized for small understand loads. So the toy helicopters could then go and distribute them uh, widely. Um, uh, and they, they wouldn't have caused the, the damage that we would have done. So it was a real team effort, uh, Ruman. Mm -hmm. So we were on a, a, a naval ship, uh, in fact it was HMS Ocean Swan Song. We had two of our Chinooks, we had three green merlins for the Navy, one was being used as a Christmas tree for uh, spares, and then three wildcats. And actually the uh, moving all the kit around worked really, really well. Um, and it was, it was, I was really proud to actually be part of it. It's nice to go help to deploy somewhere and not take a gun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, amazing images we've got on the screen here, um, Al, and, uh, you know, it's, um, I'm sure it was a, re a particularly rewarding um, mission once again, e even though you weren't being shot at, um, actually knowing that you're making a difference and, and you know, improving people's lives. And, um, you know, I, I, there's, there's um, a lot of uh, that training and experience i'm sure that was cashed in on those on those particular sorties where uh you know it's very challenging flying um so um you know i uh i i really can't wait to read your book because i think you need to read a book <laughs> I'll I'll read right one. <laughs> um so let's uh, let's turn to what you're up to now um um i i believe you're um you're sort of midway through your um your uh, multi-engine crossover. So tell us about that. What, what's the next chapter? Um, I, having done uh, helicopters for the last 20 years, um, my army friends have been bantering me uh, for being a stinking crab now for, since 2007. Uh, it makes no difference which service you're in when you work for GHC. Uh, they're all the same. So I needed to get away and do something completely different. Um, and for me, it was uh, joining the real Air Force uh, and going to find some, something big. Um, I still like putting a flight suit on and having the requirements for the flight suit. And I like doing stuff that civilians don't get to do. So 
the operational stuff is a lot is in my bag. So C17 or A400 when it when it takes over from the Herc whenever it does and starts building on its role, I think will be fascinating. Mm. And I'll travel the world and live in my five star hotels. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is how do they say the Navy navigates by the stars, the Army sleeps under the stars, and what does the Air Force do? <laughs> yeah, we check in, we don't dig in. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so um and, and tell us about um the historic army aircraft flight and, and historic helicopters i mean this is where you've got all that experience to give now isn't it uh, and give something yeah. back on the air show circuit you know what, what's going on there um oh, i'm trying to remember about eight years ago when risk was the big word um commander jc at the time turned around and said why am i why am i holding the risk for these Historic, heli uh, historic aircraft at Middle Wall. They don't bring anything to the party. So when that was said, um, we had a trust formed already, and George Bacon, that I think you probably know very well, um, he and his team came up with a cunning plan to take the aircraft on and run them as a, as a, a charity, uh, with the idea of uh, promoting the history of Army aviation, but also, um, Giving, giving back to the veterans um, and supporting the veterans in, in any way that we can. Um, so with that, we have two, well, two, soon to be three fixed wing uh, aircraft. We've got the Beaver and the um, Oster AOP-9. And we're getting the Chipmunk back up and running uh, imminently. We also have uh, the Scout, which I fly, which you can see there, and the Sioux, which is, is the Bell 47, the Clockwork Mouse, um, fantastic aircraft. So it's a real privilege to fly these aircraft. I, when I did my test with John Beatty, who if you haven't interviewed yet, you need to interview. You think, oh, I've got this, John, you'll need to extend a long time with John. Uh, he asked me, why, why did I want to fly a scan? And I said, well, I will never get to fly a Spitfire. This is my Spitfire. Yeah. Um, so we run it all up as a charity. Um, that was a, a week of flying uh, Breitling employees. Uh, and those happened to be the, the wing walkers at the time. And I, I'm looking very disappointed with my catch. Um, <laughs> see. Yeah. Uh, but we, where we can, where we, if people donate, they, we can, because all the aircraft are on the civilian register, we can take them flying. Um, and, and it's such a privilege to fly with, uh, with some of these people, some of them that haven't flown, I flew a, an XW01, hadn't flown since 78, um, and his granddaughter had uh, brought him along for, uh, I think it was his 80th birthday or something like that, and said, uh, can granddad wear his flight? So he says, he's better wear his flight, he's got to look the part. And he put this thing on and he, he had such a smile on his face uh, and it fit like it was uh, still made for him like the other day. Yeah. And anyway, we, I got in the aircraft uh, flew him, started flying around Andover, handed over control to him, and it just came flooding back. He flew it all the way back round to Middle Wallop, uh, back into towards dispersal, and he was so chuffed. Um, and it's a great privilege to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so, as you know, we put the display team together. We've had uh, we've had good success over the last two years. Unfortunately, with COVID this year, uh, we were hoping to build on our success from last year. Um, but at the Yeovilton Air Show, uh, we won the uh, the prize for the best display with a, a rotary asset to it, which we were really, really happy about because myself and the team uh, put a lot of work into choreographing a, a, a display where there is something going on all the time, but nothing too dynamic. We're not trying to display, you know, look at the aircraft and go up to an end and all like that. We're trying to display the aircraft in a situation where the, the general public can get as many photos as they can of as many aircraft at the same time as they can. Um, mm. and, and it was it was interesting putting it together and I think we've done quite a good job with it, which is nice. Yeah, and, and I know that uh, obviously the Genesis was was the um was it the Army Historic Flight and the and the, and the Silver Eagles, you know, I know I know it goes back uh, a long time and I and I agree, I think it's really important to uh, you know, educate um, the next generation. Um, Very most much certainly. Yeah. Very yeah. much. Uh, and we're lucky. We've had 
um, or before COVID, we had quite a few uh, uh, two recruits coming up to visit us, uh, guys on pilot tours, because it was, we shared the hangar with the squirrel where they were doing their um, their end of, um, was it, OTP, operational training phase. We shared the hangar with them. So mm. guys, before they got their wings, were walking back and forth on a Thursday and Friday. They'd see the engineers working. They'd see us flying the aircraft. So it, it gave us that little bit of um, connection with them. Um, unfortunately, now all the Army training is done up at uh, Shawbury. Mm. We don't do any fly pass. For the, we used to do the fly pass for the wings, which is great fun. Um, yeah. The last one, I think, uh, Prince Harry uh, presented the wings and we did the fly pass for him. It was really, really, really yeah. nice. Yeah, I'm sure. And, uh, and, and obviously you've now... Uh, got yourself uh, into a Wessex, uh, oh, following in your father's footsteps. Yeah, um, I'm very privileged to be uh, part of the team down at Historic Helicopters at Charles. Um, Andrew Whitehouse and his team, uh, they have they have set up a fantastic um, unit down there. Um, the chief pilot is Steve Daniels. He's soon to retire from the Empire Test Pilot School as the, uh, I think, the chief tutor there. Uh, a man of vast experience, just he's there on uh, with the, the Navy wings. Um, Andrew has uh, the only whirlwind, the only Wessex, and I believe six, soon to be six Seekings, uh, all flying out of chart. And he's got a, a Lynx Mark 7 uh, that he's, he's starting to get up and running as well. Uh, anyone that is uh, that watches The Crown, um, mm-hmm. Wessex is on episode four, um, and there's a few other TV programs that uh, the relevant aircraft, or various aircraft, will be part of. Um, it's a fantastic setup, and nothing has been scrimped. The mm. it took 18 months to get the Wessex back in the air, having not flown for 32 years, and I think when the first seeking did its first test flight. The only thing that was wrong with it was a, a light bulb on one of the uh, one of the consoles. Um, the standard of engineering and the the flying uh, instruction down there was brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. That the guy that taught me to fly it, my father had taught him how to fly the whirlwind, and then John mm-hmm. then taught me to fly the links when I went through conversion training, and now the Wessex. Um, yeah, he's another one with thousands of hours and lots and lots of stories. Um, yeah, yeah, he'd be good to have on there. And a nice, a nice personal personal link for you, uh, which, which is yeah, bringing it back home. That's oh, lovely. Well, well, it's uh, it's lunchtime. Um, I I could sit here for another two hours. Uh, Al, I really could. I, I think you've got a fascinating background, um, and uh, you know. Uh, these talks are called inspirability talks um, because it's designed to inspire not only us but the next generation um yes it's fun to hear all the stories but actually you know i i i I'd, I'd um question anybody who hasn't been inspired by your story al um and particularly you know what you've done uh, in service uh, but not just you i know others uh, listening and watching as well today uh, so, uh, you know, for that, um, I think we can all be uh, exceptionally grateful to you. Um, and I'm looking forward to the book. I think you do need to write a book. Um, so happy, happy to, uh, happy to support you on that one. Um, and, I, and, who, and who's your favourite crewman? Uh, uh, that would be a hard one. But um, <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact Liz is looking at me there. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be you, Liz, and then Vish. <laughs> <laughs> right well look there's um there's a couple of questions that i had come in um uh, before the talk and they, they came in through social media um so the the so question is of course it'll be all right well it's it, no, it, it's one on algebra is that okay <laughs> <laughs> right okay um no so the the, the question the question is about uh, your time in afghanistan and the um the other um coalition um forces that you were working with uh, and the question here is how did you fly with uh you know uh, uh, other other helicopters from other air forces you know what was the you know what was the big picture um it depended on who we were flying with and what the job was 
the we did another job down uh, so, so going back to the Musicala job, we had Dutch ourselves and the Americans. Um, we briefed and planned, also oh, planned a brief together. Um, but then our individual profiles, we we did we flew different routes, came together, and then the landing sites were all subtly different. So we never we weren't landing next to a foreign aircraft. Um, and that was all right because they were they were all Chinooks that landed. But we did another job south in the green zone, south of Baskin, uh, on a um, on a job a couple of three years later. And we worked with CH-53s uh, and the Osprey B-22s of the US Marine Corps. And again, we did the planning and briefing together and the rehearsals. And then when we actually did the job, when when you left the the latter part of the uh, the route, you'd have three independent landing sites. So there was no confliction of, uh, of, of who you could bump into, okay? I knew that the guys on the side of me were RAF Chinooks, and then about a mile to the left were the Ospreys and a mile to the right were the 53s. I see, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that, that big battle plan is, uh, is, is, you know, it's all in the plan, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. No, yeah. is, is they um, yeah. And the last question I've got here is, um looking back and also looking forwards what is the number one aircraft you'd like to have either flown that you never did or would like to fly that's coming up in the future oh, okay uh, is this realistic or or if i had uh upting uh if, pounds in my bank if i had any if, if money wasn't an option i'd, I'd definitely have a game of spitfire uh that yeah. gotta be the, the queen of the sky or or the hunter. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I, I'm looking forward to flying either the C-17 or the A-400. Um, mm. C-17 is well established. Um, and the uh, from what I gather, the, the job is good, the aircraft is good, and the work routine is good. Um, the A-400 is still establishing itself, and it will evolve uh, whilst, uh, whilst I'm on it, and therefore take on these interesting tasks, which Joe Public doesn't get the sea or do um which i think is brilliant yeah yeah sure well that's a great way to end al we'll leave you to your to your day uh, but thank you for giving your time uh, it's been really interesting and great fun so um you know i know everybody's you know, going to join me in saying a huge thank you and hopefully you know we'll see you on the display circuit next year brilliant john thank you very much indeed it's been a pleasure my pleasure too cheers al cheers bye-bye bye-bye Okay, well there we go. So that was uh, that was great fun. I really enjoyed that, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, you'll uh, be looking forward to Al's book. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to keep digging on that one. So um, we'll be back um, on your screens uh, next Saturday night, um, the 28th of November, for the Aviators Ball. Um, so you can go on to uh, aviatorsball.com or to Airability to learn more about uh, about that. It is a live stream for free. Uh, and uh, there's a live auction. Uh, the auction is up and running right now. So if you go and uh, search up Aviators Ball, um, or just go to our Airability website, you will uh, you will see uh, there are some awesome prizes there uh, that you that are up for grabs. So uh, take a look. Um, but for now, um, if you would like to just give a few pounds, you can do that through the Just Giving website. Um, I'll leave you all to your weekends and we'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.